All right, so I, anyway, that, that's, that's one case study. So that's all I'm going to say about boundary layer flashback. But I hope that kind of whet your appetite for how when you start coupling fluid mechanics and kinetics, um, you, get, you get new phenomenon, which, you wouldn't, which aren't necessarily intuitive. Um, so now I, what I want to do is talk a little bit about, a, now rather than looking at the, the boundary layer problem, I want to look at swirl flows. And I want to show you how in swirl flows, the interaction of, of exothermic fronts with the flow can also change its characteristics. So, we, so before I do that, I need to tell you a little bit about what uh, vortex breakdown is, which I've already done, sort of, with my bad pictures on the board. But these are a little bit better pictures here. And uh, so as I mentioned, when you swirl a flow, by the way, where, let me just back up for a minute and talk about swirl. Um, the reason I'm talking about flows with swirl is because probably 75% of all flowing combustion systems that are low emissions have swirl in the flow. So that's a good reason to talk about swirl, swirling flows. Um, and the reason, for the, the reason that they swirl the flow is because you get this vortex breakdown phenomenon. It's a great way to get a flow a high velocity flow with a region of low flow velocity to stabilize the plane. That, that's the bottom line of why it's done. And it's, it's almost ubiquitous, whether it's an airplane engine, all aircraft engines are swirled. Whether it's GE, Rolls-Royce, Pratt Whitney, um, boilers for heaters, but, you know, they're all, they're all swirled. So it's, it, swirl's an important thing to look at. But again, the bottom line is if you've got a flow going from left to right here, and if it has azimuthal, um, an azimuthal flow component. And we can define a swirl number, S, as basically a ratio of azimuthal velocity to axial velocity. So when that ratio exceeds some critical value, you get this vortex breakdown phenomenon. And I've drawn those streamlines here. You get these stagnation points. Um, and this stagnation point enables a very low flow velocity region. And what will happen is this will enable a flame to stabilize basically aerodynamically out here. Um, and so here are a couple images just illustrating this. So, for example, if we look at this flow, what they've done is they've added some dye to the very center dividing streamline. So imagine that I added some dye to this line right here. So it's coming at this stagnation point. It's decelerating. So it's zinging along, you know, I said 100 meters per second. So it's zinging along at 100 meters per second. It, all of a sudden, it starts feeling that, that stagnation point. It really starts decelerating. And you get this stagnation point. So you can see it hitting that point, And then it actually, the flow moves around it. So you can see it moving around. And kind of all this crazy fluid in the middle, this is allowing you some visualization of, the, of this vortex breakdown bubble. So this is a really pretty picture from Sarpkaya of uh, this phenomenon. This is another image also of vortex breakdown. You know, you can see here's, again, they've seeded the center of the flow. And you can see it's moving along. And all of a sudden, Something tells it to get out of the way, and it moves. And it, it gets it's moving around. Um, this is a swirling. Whoops, this is a swirling flow um, where they've actually seeded the entire jet. So this is a jet. So you're looking at the streamlines coming out, and notice how something's happening here. You basically take a round jet, and again, some the flow. There's the stagnation point. You can see how it actually divides around that recirculation zone. So basically, you go from a jet to an annulus. So this is, this is a, obviously it goes all the way around, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a circular flow. And so you're looking at a laser slice, but you can see the flow, a jet flow here, now all the fluid is moving through here or through there. So it's become an annular flow. And you can see that there's some really interesting fluid mechanics in the middle, and there's this flow recirculation that's happening there. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this stuff. There's some really interesting unsteady features of, of, of swirl flows, which I just don't have time to get into. Um, whew, hurts me to skip all this good stuff. Um, <laughs> I just talked too long. Um, but I think I'll have to skip it. And I'll just come, come back to the, to the main point, which is that when you have that the, the point where vortex breakdown occurs is very sensitive to adverse pressure gradients. All right? And so what can happen is if you take a flow with an adverse pressure gradient, you can actually force the flow to break down. And the reason for that is, let me just tell you why real quick, that if you have a flow 
an adverse pressure gradient is, is synonymous with saying that the flow is decelerating. That's the momentum equation. So if the flow is decelerating in this direction, by continuity, it has to, you have to introduce a radial component to it. And so what happens is, is that you, 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 you basically, as soon as you get a, a decelerating flow, you get streamlines that look like this. And as soon as you get a streamline that goes like that, that kind of starts the cascade of this vortex breakdown instability. Um, but as we've talked about, as soon as you curve a flame, you know, so if you have a flame that's curved like that, that, inter that imposes an adverse pressure gradient on the approach flow. And so what that will do is it will cause the flow, the, 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 um, the flow to break down. You get vortex breakdown in front of the flame. All right, so you have a flow. It's moving this fast, 100 meters per second. There's no way a flame can propagate upstream into 100 meters per second flow. But that flow is thinking about, being, about breaking down. As soon as, if somehow you can put a flame in there, you know, let's just say you put a torch or something like that, that causes breakdown. Now all of a sudden you have a low velocity or even a reverse flow, and the flame moves forward. As soon as the flame moves forward, it adverse pressure gradients, it back pressures the approach flow, it breaks down. And so again, the flame gets sucked up into the mixture, even though the flow velocity on average is two orders of magnitude higher than the flame speed. And so I've tried to draw that, actually I didn't draw this, this is Thomas Saddlemeyer from TU Munich just illustrating this point about how a flame can shoot upstream, is, is that here's the flame, causes breakdown. As soon as you get breakdown, the flame can move forward and so forth. And I've, I've kind of walked through these steps here. Um, you get an adverse pressure gradient. It generates a lower and negative velocity region upstream of the flame. The flame adverse advances further, which causes the vortex breakdown location to move forward. With. So a completely different example, but again, whether a boundary layer, the flame can change its stability characteristics, cause it to separate. A swirl flow, it can cause vortex breakdown. Anyone have any questions about that? Okay, so that is all I'm going to say about flashback. Um, I do, right here. I can put it right there. Yep. Thanks. Is that better? Okay, you'll know in a minute. Okay, so let's move on to the next topic. So that was kind of an introduction to, I talked about flashback, but more generally what it was was a discussion of aerodynamics of flames and how flames um, influence the, the, the flow field. Now I want to talk, I want to switch gears a little bit, a bit, little bit, and I want to talk about flame stabilization. How is it that flames can be stabilized in high velocity flows? And so um, we'll start with some just, again, some introductory concepts, kind of classical treatment, and then we're going to dig into two important concepts. First, we're going to talk about flame stretch. So I think, did you guys in your, earlier this week, talk about flame stretch in one of your classes? So I'll just, you guys will give me body language, so, you know, you can say slow down, speed up, whatever, when I talk about flame stretch. Actually, when I taught this class two years ago, I didn't even talk about flame stretch, but nobody knew, what, or more than half the class didn't know what I was talking about, so I added it back. But we can go as fast or slow as we needed. The other thing piece we need to talk about are edge flames, which I, the very beginning of this afternoon I talked about, because real flames have edges. They start and they stop, and we need to talk about that structure. And then I want to talk about flame stabilization in shear layers and flame stabilization by stagnation points. So the problem I'm interested, the practical, the technology problem I'm interested in is under what conditions will a flame stabilize in a flow, and under what conditions will it blow out. And, uh, but in order to do that, we needed to do some fundamental stuff about stretch and, and edge flames. So let's start with, with um, some introductory concepts. So in general, flame stabilization requires a point where the flow speed and the flame speed match. And so there's two ways that you can make this happen. You can either have it in a region of low flow velocity, and, and as a in any kind of real application, flow velocities are much, much higher than flame speed. So no real application do you get low flow velocities except by aerodynamically decelerating the flow. So swirl, vortex breakdown, that's, that's where that happens, is that by adding swirl, by causing vortex breakdown, you can create local regions of the flow that are low velocity, even though on average the flow has a very high velocity, which is much greater than your flame speed. 
The other way that you can get a low velocity region is in a high shear region. So in general, flames like to stabilize at, you know, they like to attach at edges of backward facing steps or during rapid expansions. And what happens there is, is that the flow is basically transitioning from basically, you know, a boundary layer flow in, into this outer flow. And you get these very high shear regions. The flame sits in those. And that's, you know, you're basically, it's sitting in this separating boundary layer. Um, it's not the high shear that makes the flame sits there, sit there. It's the low flow velocity. It just so happens that 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 low flow velocity region is accompanied by very, very high gradients. So we need to understand what, what is the effect of shear or, or, or significant gradients in the flow due to flame propagation. Let me, I don't think I did a good job explaining that. Let me try that one more time. Um, so simple example, backward facing step, flow is going like this, okay? Flame is going to basically look like that. It's going to stabilize right there and then it's going to spread into the reactants and the angle is going to be a function of the flow velocity and the flame speed. Why does the flame sit here? Well, because the flow, if it can't flash back, let's, if it's not flashing back, it's not, it can't get up here. But basically you have this low velocity region here in the boundary layer. And so once it, once the, um, it assume, pre, assume, presumably it's not flashing back because the heat loss is to the wall. But as soon as that boundary layer separates, there's that very low velocity fluid away from the wall, the flame can park itself there. But again, very high shear, right? If you have a, let's say, a 100 meter per second flow and a few millimeter boundary layer, that's a big velocity gradient over, um, so we need to understand that. So, this is a kind of, a, let's just make sure I know what I'm going to talk about next. Um, I got a bad habit of jumping ahead to my next slides before I get to them. This is, this is kind of a picture of, of the classical treatment, and you should probably recognize this type of picture, um, which talks about under what conditions will a flame attach in a separating boundary layer, and under what conditions will it blow off. All right, so let's just, well, I'm gonna, let's review this classical treatment here. Um, and so just to kind of get things started here, what we've drawn are these would, the flow is going left to right, and A, B, and C denote three different velocity profiles. So these are UX, it's the axial velocity. So this would be a high gradient flow, C would be a low gradient flow. The dotted line describes the axial variation, excuse me, the radial variation of the um, flame speed. So we're assuming we have some flame speed given by, remember S sub D denotes displacement speed, superscript U denotes with respect to the reactants. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just it's SL, flame speed. And we're going to assume that it goes to zero within some quenching distance from the wall, del Q. And uh, so we can say, all right, well, now, in order to have a state, a flame that doesn't blow off, the um, flow velocity and the flame speed have got to match at some point. Otherwise, it's kind of like you're in a river and you're swimming. If you swim slower than the river's velocity, you're going to be convecting downstream, right? You just That's just how life is. If you can find a spot close to the shore where the flow velocity is low, you can find a spot where you can stay not washing downstream, right? That's that's basically um, flash, uh, the, the, the problem of um, flame stabilization. So the profile that we've drawn in A that flame's going to blow off. The flow velocity is everywhere higher than the flame speed. Now C, that flame will actually flash back, right? Because there is a part of the flame where the flame speed is higher than the flow speed. So this part of the flame between here and here is actually going to be moving upstream. So that flame is going to that whole flame is going to be moving upstream. That's, that flame is going to flash back. Configuration B is your magic special flame uh, where the flame speed and the flow speed match at one point, this point right here. So that flame is going to park right there. It's going to attach itself right there and then it's going to spread into the reactants outside of there. So this is that sort of that special flame. But what this suggests is that there's only one velocity profile that will give you a, 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 um, a stable flame. So it suggests that stable flames are a very, very, very rare 
beast indeed, right? That you've got to have exactly the right flow velocity. And in fact, if it's just a teensy weensy bit too high or too low, then the flame's either going to blow off or flash back. But in, 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 it turns out there's actually that there's the, the problem's a little bit more dynamic and there's some self-stabilization mechanisms. For example, um, if this flame, which nominally sits right there, and then it spreads into the reactants, if it starts, let's say I drop the flow velocity to C, it's going to start flashing back. Well, then it's going to start seeing the wall, and then the quenching profile might change. And so it wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't flash back much more. Or if the flame started to move, if I moved it to A, if I, the flame would start to move downstream, well, then it wouldn't feel the wall, and then this velocity profile, the quenching distance profile would change. And so the flame, there's a certain, over a certain range of, of, of velocities, the exact stabilization point has some internal stabilization uh, processes that happen. And you... That's good, right? Well, we all know that you can that stable flames do exist. That don't that they don't exist at a discrete value. But um, so there's this range over which you get stable flames. There's a range where you get flashback, which we've talked about. There's this range over which you get blow up. Um, and uh, you know, just a, this would be a typical plot of stabilization boundaries where you have, if you are inside of this curve, you are a flashback. Um, and this is equivalence ratio. This is flow velocity. And so this, is, this would be blow off of a jet flame into air or into nitrogen or into CO2. So for example, the air plot, what's happening is, is that um, it monotonically increases with equivalence ratio. What's happening here is, is that when you're on the lean side, at, you can go to higher and higher flow velocities without blow off. And in fact, once you go to past an equivalence ratio of 1, um, the reason the curve doesn't swing around is because <clears throat> if you're rich and you're mixing with ambient air, the equivalence ratio is brought back is, is, is brought back to lean. So it's basically almost impossible to blow the flame out. Whereas if the ambient is nitrogen or CO2, since that's a diluent, then this curve swings back around. So the, the bottom line is, is that this flashback curve generally has this type of behavior, symmetric around phi equals 1. And only if your ambient is an inert does the blow-off line have that behavior. Otherwise, it nominally increases, continuously increases with fuel air ratio. All right. Now, in most real applications, what makes life even more interesting is that there's not a single flame stabilization location. There's actually multiple different types of flame stabilization locations, and you can get multiple families of flame shape. So for example, um, this would be a pretty typical example of a flow in, in the, at least more than half of, of low NOx combustion systems, no matter what the application is, where you'd have a flow, this flow is going left to right, it's an annular flow, um, and it's swirling. All right? So this is a flow with vortex breakdown, and so there's this actually this low velocity region here. And so at low equivalence ratios, you'll get a flame that's what I'll call aerodynamically stabilized. It, it finds a point where the flame speed and the flow speed match each other, and the flame sits there. Now, as I increase equivalence ratio, actually the flame will, will actually pop upstream, and it catches in this shear layer right there. Right? So now I have a shear layer. This, this flame here and this flame steer here are both stabilized in the shear layer, and um, what I have is a shear layer stabilized flame. Now, the reason that the flame at the lowest equivalence ratio, which was this configuration, doesn't sit in the shear layer is because, as we'll talk about, if the shear rate is too high, if the flame stretch rate is too high, the flame extinguishes. So it turns out that the flame is, can't exist right here. Too much shear, too much stretch, the flame extinguishes. However, those gradients smooth out a little bit as you move downstream and it can aerodynamically stabilize. Um, so, and by the way, with all of these, as you go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, we're increasing equivalence ratio. And I'm just showing you what the flames look like. And these are line of sight images of an axisymmetric flow. Well, as we move from, as we increase equivalence ratio from 3 to 4, what basically happens is, is that the flame stabilizes both in the inner shear layer and the outer shear layer. These are line of sight chemiluminescence, so it's a little tricky to interpret these if you're not used to looking at them. But basically what's happening here is, here's my flow. So here's my reactants. So at lower equivalence ratios, what's happening is you're getting a flame that's stabilized 
in this shear layer and then reactants are flowing into it. As they flow through the flame, the reactants get turned into products. So everything in here is products, everything out here is reactants, all right? It's going to spread to the walls, let's say. Now, what happens is that's, in, that's what the flames in two and three look like. Um, as you further increase the equivalence ratio, what's happening there in four is that the flame now looks like this. It can catch, it actually can stabilize in this shear layer too. So apparently in this geometry, the flame has an easier time in this shear layer than in that shear layer. Apparently the, the, um, there's more, there's higher gradients at this separation point than in this separation point. Um, and I, if, if someone wants to know why, I can explain, but it's a little bit tangential. So actually the flame looks like that. So if I took like a laser cut, that's, this is what I would see. So these are reactants. So they're basically, you know, they're flowing through the flame. Reactants are getting turned into products. And so this is reactants. This is products. This is products here. This is reactants. Um, so bottom line is, you know, this is a very real geometry. There's, there's basically at least three, maybe four different, fundamentally different families of flame shapes that can happen in real systems. And so I, I motivated this discussion by talking about trying to understand blowout. But in reality, it turns out that the general problem of where flames can, stabilize, can or can't stabilize is even more general than that. Because if we want to understand what the flame looks like, where is the heat release happening? How long is the flame? we got to understand flame stabilization more generally. Because basically what's happening is, is that, for example, this configuration, what I called four, by the way, these numbers four here, the flame can stabilize there. If I were to drop the equivalence ratio so it moves to three, basically what I have is, is a, is a blow-off problem. But what's happening is the flame is locally blowing out of this shear layer. But since it can still stabilize here, the flame is still there. It just has a completely different shape. It moves from configuration, this configuration three to configuration four. As I drop the equivalence ratio more, it goes from this. You guys can't see me pointing at my screen, can you? It goes from this to this shape. This is just a change in the fluid mechanics. So it's really, they're both shear layer stabilized. And as I go from here to here, the inner shear layer blows off, but the flame still exists. It doesn't blow out completely because I have this stagnation point. And if I decrease the equivalence ratio further, poof, out goes the flame. So you can see, again, this problem of blowout is not just the problem of can a flame exist inside of a combustor, but it's a more general problem of, What's the flame shape? How long is the flame? Where's the heat release happening? And so forth. And it turns out that those are very, very important other questions um, to lots of interesting problems. Like, for example, if you want to predict life of components, you can imagine, and here I've drawn just some different flame shapes. This is an aerodynamically stabilized. This one's stabilized in only in the outer shear layer. This one's stabilized in the inner shear layer. This one's stabilized in the inner and outer shear layer. You can imagine that these configurations where the flame is sitting on metal, like in B or C or D, that that's going to be having a different life profile than configuration A. Just hot, hot flame sitting on metal reduces part life. Um, we're going to talk about combustion instabilities later, but it turns out probably the single most important parameter controlling where you do and don't get combustion instabilities is how long is the flame. And we'll, I'll talk about that later, why that is. But just for now, just trust me. And so when that, inner, when that outer shear layer catches, as it does in D, versus blows out like it does in C, the flame length is basically going to change by roughly a factor of two. So where you get acoustic oscillations, spontaneous acoustic oscillations for this shape, and this shape, totally different. And in fact, this transition is very abrupt. This flame doesn't gradually transition between C and D. You'll, you're taking data, and you'll be just gradually touching down, reducing the fuel, and all of a sudden, bang, completely different flame shape. All right? And so since this also influences things like metal temperatures, you can imagine if you were making a, a wall temperature measurement here, you would, ex you would see basically a step change in wall temperature as you change fuel air ratio, or a step change in, um, in acoustic pulsation levels due to these things. So anyway, I just wanted to just, again, point out that the blow-off problem is more general than just blow-off. Yes, sir? Are these four figures showing the same conditions as the four figures in the previous slide? Um, nominally, except I didn't have a flame shape B in the previous slide. But nominally, this C right here is the same as this flame shape here. This D right here 
is the same as this flame shape there. This one right here is aerodynamically stabilized, roughly the same as that one there. Okay, so that's just kind of a quick, quick background here. So now what I want to get into a little bit is under what conditions can flames stabilize in shear layers? Um, we know that the flow velocity is low, so let me just back up a slide here. So we know that somewhere in that shear layer I should be able to find a condition where the flame speed and the flow velocity match. So that makes sense, but the question is the flame is going to be in a region of very, very high velocity gradients. What do those velocity gradients do to the flame structure? So that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, so in order to do that, we're, so now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of start a new discussion here, and we're going to talk about effects of stretch on flames. All right, and so in, before I do that, I, let's first review kind of a flat premixed flame ideas. So let's assume I have an adiabatic flame, so there's no radiative heat losses. It's one-dimensional, it's planar. I have reactants approaching it, getting converted into products. So, first of all, the temperature of the products is going to be the adiabatic flame temperature, right? So, that's that. I also can define sort of a mass burning rate, which is the rate that the flame is converting reactants into products, kind of kilograms per meter squared per second kind of deal, you know. Per unit surface area, how, how quickly is the flame converting reactants to products? And that's basically the product of the density times the flow of rho unburned times U unburned. Um, by the way, small nomenclature inconsistency here is here the U is a subscript. My other slides I had it as a superscript, but the U denotes unburned. Uh, so this, this is the mass flux per unit area. So that's in this, in this flow velocity approaching the flame, if the flame is stationary, is equal to the flame speed, SL. The uh, superscript not denotes unstretched. Um, so this is the mass burning rate, and again, this is equal to the density of the burn products times the velocity of the burn products, and that's the mass burning flux. Um, and so this flame speed, this unstretched flame speed, it's a fundamental property of the fuel oxidizer mixture, which is a function of diffusivity rates and kinetic rates and uh, temperatures of reactants and pressures and things like that. So I'm not going to get more into that. But bottom line, if you know, kind of a, a simple one-step kinetics description of flat premix flames is that you have these two zones, right? And there's this react, excuse me, there's the preheat zone and there's a reaction zone. Simple one-step kinetic description and realize that real multi complex kinetics is a little bit more complex than that. But that's a good place to start. Preheat zone, reaction zone. What happens in the preheat zone? No reaction. It's just a, it's a heater upper, right? It takes the reactants and it heats it up to the point where your high activation energy kinetics can really take off. What's the reaction zone? It's basically a highly non-adiabatic reactor where it takes the mixture which is reacting and it gives all the heat that's generated back into the preheat zone to, to preheat the mixture. And so you have this synergistic relationship between the preheat zone and the reaction zone where they interact with each other to take a, an essentially chemically frozen mixture and bring it to equilibrium. Okay, so what happens if a flame is not flat? So let's start thinking about perturbations to that basic picture. And so what I want to do, what I've drawn here is this is a big time zoom of a flame. So the, the, the filled in zone denotes the reaction zone. That's here. And then this, between this front leading edge and that line is the preheat zone. All right, so preheat zone, reaction zone. This solid line denotes a stream tube. All right, and so what I want to do is I want to think about energy conservation here as applied to the stream tube. And the reason, now if it's a stream tube, it has the nice property that I know that there's no convection across the walls of a stream tube by definition, right? Convection only occurs in the direction of the flow. And so stuff is convecting in and stuff's convecting out, but I know that again from a, um, pure convection process, nothing is convecting across these walls. The, um, these lines here are lines which are drawn normal to gradients. Okay, So these are diffusive vectors. So this, um, this line here denotes the heat flux vector. So I'm assuming that I have isotherms. So imagine that this is a high temperature isotherm, 
reactant isotherm. You can imagine drawing in all these intermediate isotherms. And Fourier um, diffusion says that gradients occur in the direction normal to gradients. So stuff's going to be diffusing in the direction normal to these gradients. Um, and because it's high temperature here, low temperature here, stuff's going to be, heat is going to be being passed back from the reaction zone to the preheat zone along these vectors. What's also drawn with these dashed lines are mass flux. So there are also concentration gradients, right? We know, again, this one-step kinetic description is, is that you know, we have lots of reactants on the leading edge of the front, and, and those are diffusing forward. You have such massive gradients through the preheat zone that the reactants are, in, are actually diffusing forward just as heat is diffusing backwards. Yes, sir? Um, so the question is, how thick is the preheat zone, and what metric would I use to quantify it? You know, the, uh, there's, there's not a universal definition of the preheat zone. I, th I would just say that, and frankly, it doesn't even matter so much for the purposes of this discussion. Basically, the, uh, the, the reaction zone I would define as the region where there's non-negligible chemical reactions, and the preheat zone is everything upstream of that, up to the isotherm, up to the, to the reactants. But... We don't need to get into, you know, when you actually start analyzing data, you have to define it. And there's multiple definitions of these, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. But so what I'm trying to draw here is this is mass flux of reactants. And, and so, again, high concentration of reactants on the reactant side, zero reactants on the product side. So there's going to be a net diffusive flux vector, net, net diffusive flux along this line normal to the concentration gradient. So I'm assuming that my concentration gradients and my temperature gradients are roughly aligned in this picture. Oops. Now, so we can think about what happens here. And so what you see is happening is if, if I draw a control volume around this preheat zone, I have heat being you know, sort of the flat, the, the, the description that we have for flat flames is there's a certain convective flux coming in this side, and it's he preheated by this diffusive flux going, going back this way. And, um, and so there's this, and they, they balance each other. But what happens is as soon as the flame is curved, this control volume right here is receiving heat from parts of the flame which are where, where there's no convective flux, right? So it's basically, there's, the, the heat is being focused, but another way to think about it is that if the flame is flat, that although this part of the, um, excuse me, although the reaction zone is non-adiabatic and it's heating up the, the preheat zone, the preheat zone is giving you back, so, so they're, they're interacting with each other in a synergistic way. As soon as you curve the flame, this reaction zone, the, the fact that it's non-adiabatic is this part of the flame is giving heat away to a part of the flow which it's not going to receive that, that feedback back from. Um, and so it's basically non-adiabatic. It's, it's, this part of the flame is, is losing heat, but my control volume is gaining net thermal energy is, is, is the bottom line, right, because of, of heat flux. So it's getting, it's getting um, diffusive, uh, through diffusive processes, it's getting net heat, heat in to it that it didn't, didn't come from this part of the preheat zone. On the other hand, it is potentially losing chemical energy because of mass flux, right? So in general, what's happening is this mass is diffusing into this reaction zone, but it's actually losing chemical energy. And so you'd say, okay, so what's the effect of this stuff? We're potentially gaining thermal energy, losing um, chemical energy. Well, the gaining thermal energy suggests that the mixture is going to actually be preheated above what it would be if the flame was flat. Losing the chemical energy is a, in effect that, that, that goes in the other direction. Turns, so it, it turns out that what matters is the Lewis number. For, for 1D kinetics, what, it, it's the Lewis number. And the Lewis number tells me what is the relative ratio of thermal diffusion to mass diffusion, right? That's, that's what the Lewis number is. And if the Lewis number is 1, the gain of thermal energy and the loss of um, chemical energy exactly balance, and flame temperature doesn't change, flame speed doesn't change. If, however, the thermal diffusivity is greater than the mass diffusivity, then this control volume is going to be getting more energy than it loses, and that's going to cause the, the flame temperature to exceed the adiabatic flame temperature. You get a super adiabatic flame.
All right, you get a flame temperature that's higher, and that also because these reaction because these um, reaction rates are so temperature sensitive, that also causes the flame speed to go up higher than what it would be if it was flat. On the other hand, if the mass diffusivity is greater than the thermal diffusivity, the opposite happens. This this uh, control volume is is losing net energy. Flame temperature is lower than the adiabatic flame temperature. Flame speed is lower than the unstretched value. Okay, so that's what happens if a flame is flat. Well, what happens if now, let's think about another one. What happens if the flow field isn't 1D, all right? And to illustrate that, let's consider this stagnation flow. So I have flow going this way. Here's a stagnation. Here's just a flat piece of metal. And because of the stagnation plate, my stream tubes diverge, all right? And let's assume, just for sake of, just to keep things simple, that I have a flat flame. So again, this solid, this dark black denotes the reaction zone. This region in here denotes the preheat zone. So in this line here is a stream tube. And again, by definition, since it's a stream tube, there's no net mass convection across the walls of a stream tube. There can be thermal, there can be diffusive motion of, of mass and energy across. But my convection of energy, my convection of mass, by definition, there's nothing across the walls. And so again, we can do an energy balance in this thing. And we can say, all right, well, in this case, actually, we are losing thermal energy, that, that this, this stream, that this um, control volume is going to actually be losing thermal energy, potentially gaining chemical energy, right? Since this is the walls of my control volume, thermal energy is leaving my control volume. Chemical energy is potentially entering it. And so for this problem, you can see that if the, um, if the DT, the thermal diffusive coefficient, is greater than the mass diffusive coefficient, this would actually cause a net loss in energy in my control volume. Flame temperature would be lower than the adiabatic flame temperature. Flame speed would drop. So what's the common theme to both of these two problems? These are two steady state problems. The common theme is that there's a misaligned convective and diffusive flux. All right. So that's really the key thing that we're going to, that, that, that steady flame stretch does. If you have unsteadiness, there's an additional effect, which we'll get into a little bit later. But in a steady flow, Flame stretch is synonymous with saying that you have misaligned convective fluxes and diffusive fluxes. And that balance that you have, that synergistic balance between preheat zone and reaction zone gets disturbed. And that disturbance can be positive. It can increase temperatures, increase reaction rates and flame speeds, or it can be negative. And which one it is depends on your Lewis number. Does anyone have a question? Yes, sir. The opposite. Yeah. So if I drew, so the question is, what would happen if the flame was fl had opposite direction of curvature? Yeah. So the the exact opposite phenomenon would happen. Yep. Or. What would happen in this flow if the flow, instead of diverging, was converging? Again, the opposite would happen from what I just talked about. For this one right here? In reality, the, the tube is not, in, in a real flame, because of gas expansion, the tube would not be straight. I've drawn it straight here very purposefully because I wanted to emphasize the non-alignment of the convective and diffusive fluxes. But what you can also see from this is that it's not curvature that causes flame stretch from this example. It's this misalignment of the convective and diffusive flux. So in fact, if these stream tubes, boy, I wish you guys could see me pointing at my screen. If this stream tube was rotated so that it was parallel, this flame would not be stretched. It, the, 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 um, the energy balance wouldn't be altered. So that, that's a great point, is that it's not the curvature. It's the misalignment of the convective and diffusive fluxes that the curvature introduces. In a steady, in a steady flow. As soon as you're unsteady, curvature has another effect as well, which we'll get into in a minute. So, for example, if you had, like, uh, just to draw an example, um, you know, if you could somehow magically cook up a radially diverging flow, like that. Here, this would be, this would actually be an unstretched flow, right? Because the um, the, the uh, stream tubes would be diverging 
and they would be aligned with the, the, the diffusive fluxes. So this would be an example of a curved flame that's, that's unstretched. He did, so so it's, that, it's that relative, which way the, the, the convective fluxes are going relative to the diffusive fluxes. So yeah, that's a good point. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Uh, it absolutely applies to supersonic. Yep. Just there, you got lots of compressibility. Yeah. All right, well, let's, we'll see how far we get here. So that's a high pass on what flame stretch is and why it occurs. Now let's do a kind of a level two analysis of what's happening. So I'm going to skip over this slide because we pretty much already talked about it. It has the same pictures. And I, I, here I just showed, you know, basically you're balancing convection, energy, convection, and diffusion of energy. And so bottom line here is, is that the effect of stretch, which again for a steady flame is synonymous with this um, misalignment of convective and diffusive fluxes. The question is, what does it do to the flame? What does it do to the internal structure of the flame? What does it do to your burning velocities? What does it do to reaction rates? It comes down to this question of what is the, how is stretch altering the, the energy balance inside of the, um, in, inside of the flame, in this preheat zone? Again, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of reverting here to kind of a one-step global description, but it's a good place to start. And so, does stretch cause a net energy loss or gain? Or, I didn't talk about it now, but let me introduce another concept. Does stretch cause a net change in composition inside of the control volume because of diffusive fluxes through these lateral surfaces? That's really the question. So we have to differentiate stretch and the flame response because they're not necessarily the same. The flame may be sensitive to stretch or it may be insensitive to stretch. It may be positively sensitive, it may be negatively sensitive, it may be unsensitive. But so. Um, but uh, that's but really the relationship between stretch and the flame response comes down to this question: Does stretch change the energy balance inside of the control volume? Does it change the composition? So let's real quick talk about the composition effect because I didn't get into that before. Let's suppose how could stretch change the composition of your mixture? Let me give you an example. Suppose I have hydrogen and air. All right, those are my reactants. Well, we know that hydrogen is much, much, much more diffusive than air. Right? So if we go to this picture, I talked about, well, reactants are going to be diffusing in this direction. And those reactants are both hydrogen and air. Right? Um, however, hydrogen is much more diffusive. And so in fact, the relative rate of diffusion of hydrogen in this direction is going to substantially exceed the relative rate of diffusion of, of oxygen. So what that means is, is that the hydrogen-oxygen ratio way upstream and the hydrogen-oxygen ratio in this preheat zone are going to be different. And so the local composition inside of this control volume can differ from the global average. And in this case, what's happened is, is if, since if the hydrogen-oxygen ratio is changing, the, the local fuel air ratio. So you can imagine you have a set of reactants with some global average fuel air ratio. The local fuel air ratio at the flame can differ from that value because of these differential diffusion effects. Right? I talked about Lewis number effects before, but also just as important are differential diffusion effects, ratios of diffusivities of of, of fuels and oxidizers. Um, and so another example would be, suppose your reactants was hydrogen and propane. All right, so you have a certain hydrogen propane ratio. Um, and you can imagine that the ratio of hydrogen and propane going into your control volume, because propane not so diffusive, hydrogen very diffusive, can change. So you can change your composition. OK, so we're going to now tick through. We'll talk about Lewis number effects, then we'll talk about, about differential diffusion effects. So we already talked about Lewis number effects. But what we said was that if the Lewis number was 1, in other words, if the thermal diffusivity and the um, mass diffusivity are the same, then although these diffusive fluxes are misaligned, it turns out that there's no net enthalpy loss from your control volume. Um, if, however, the Lewis number is greater than 1, your heat flux exceeds your mass flux. Then for this flame right here, which is a negatively stretched flame, and I'll explain later why we call it negatively stretched. 
This is a negatively stretched flame. For this flame here, there is a net enthalpy flux into the control volume. If the question somebody asked, if I flip the direction of curvature, that would be a positively stretched flame. There would be a net enthalpy flux out of the control volume. Okay? This right here is a positively stretched flame. So that is why for this flame, and again, I'll explain why, but when you have diverging streamlines into the flame, that gives you positive stretch. Positive stretch gives you a net enthalpy flux out of the control volume versus if they were converging streamlines, there would be a net enthalpy flux into the control volume. Now, if that's for a Lewis number greater than 1. If the Lewis number is less than 1, everything flips. So again, the sensitivity of the flame to stretch depends on the Lewis number, whether it's less than or greater than 1, and it depends upon whether the sign of stretch is positive or negative. And I'll tell you why, what makes a, a stretch positive or negative uh, later tomorrow. Um, but now let's talk about differential diffusion. So, for example, let's look at this negatively stretched flame. And this, is, this negatively stretched flame is a good model for what happens at the tip of a, of a Bunsen flame. Um, so, if we're running, let's say, methane air, since the methane is lighter than the oxygen, it's going to diffuse faster, its concentration inside of the control volume is going to decrease. So, if my overall equivalence ratio is lean, if I start out with an equivalence ratio of less than 1, concentration of methane is dropping, that means my equivalence ratio going into this, mi in, that's, that's, that's in this control volume is going to be lower than the global average. My local, I started out lean, I get leaner. Um, if my overall stoichiometric, if my overall equivalence ratio is rich, I start out rich, I move towards stoichiometric. So you can imagine that's what's going to happen here is if, that <clears throat> if I start out lean and I go leaner, that actually the flame temperature is going to drop. If I start out rich and I get moved towards stoichiometric, assuming that my flame temperature peaks at stoi near stoichiometric, then my flame temperature would actually increase. So that's what this says. The T tip, the, the temperature at the flame tip, or at this negatively curved point, is lower than T adiabatic. If the equivalence ratio was lean, if it was rich, it would be higher. The argument flips if your, if your fuel is heavier than air, right? Like propane air. So since propane diffuses slower than air, then, again, let's go to this example. If I start out lean, I'm going to be losing some oxygen, more oxygen than propane. The equivalence ratio is going to get moved towards stoichiometric. If I start out rich, it's going to become even richer. So in that case, everything, everything that I just set up here is going to flip. If my overall equivalence ratio is lean, the temperature of the flame tip is actually going to be higher than adiabatic, and so forth. It's getting a little late. I'm almost done. But, but, but what you can see is there's, there's, it depends upon relative molecular weights. It depends on the sign of, of the, of the um, stretch. But this is summarized. This is a really nice plot from uh, Professor Law's combustion physics books, which just shows that this, this is real. This happens. They measure the temperature at the flame tip. This is for methane air. This is for propane air. And so if we go back here, what we said was that if we're lean, the temperature at the flame tip is going to be lower than T adiabatic. And that's, in fact, what they measured. So this is a calculated adiabatic flame temperature line. So flame temperature as a function of phi. And you can see that the data shows that in, there's a systematic reduction in flame temperature relative to adiabatic. When they go rich above some point, you actually get these super adiabatic flames. Notice now propane, notice how the propane curve, that's this one, is shifted. Here, when you're lean, you're actually your temperature exceeds adiabatic flame temperature. Here, it's less than the adiabatic flame temperature. And these are, these are tips of the flames. These are images of these flames where you can see it. So, for example, the rich propane flame, you can see propane doesn't like to be rich and negatively stretched because it brings down the flame temperature. In fact, if you look at that image, notice how the, it looks like even the, the flame tip might be even extinguishing or, or thinking about it's not giving off much light versus... For that lean flame where the flame temperature goes up, you can see how there's enhanced luminosity at the flame tip. Opposite happens for methane. Notice how you get the enhanced luminosity at the flame tip when you're rich and it's thinking about extinguishing when you're lean. Okay, does anyone have any questions? All right, well, I salute all you. I could not sit still till 5 o'clock one day, much less than five days. So. Have a good evening, and I guess we'll see each other at 2 o'clock.